Welcome back, everybody, to Exploring Faith, Pursuing Grace. My name is Daniel Rogers, and I'm excited to have today on the program Dr. Cheryl Bridges Johns. She is uh, a pastor, a theologian, and she has taught college and seminary classes for over 40 years. Uh, we're so excited to have her on the podcast today to talk to us about her book that's about a year old now. It's called Re-Enchanting the Text, Discovering the Bible as Sacred, Dangerous, and Mysterious. Um, Dr. Johns, or should I say Cheryl, welcome to the podcast. Cheryl, it's fun. All right. Daniel, thank you for having me. I am honored to be here on this podcast with you. I'm glad to have you as a guest as well. And since there's a little bit of a connection here um, for the audience who's kept up with the podcast over the past few years, I learned about Cheryl from Brian Zahn, uh, who was a guest last year. And he told he told me about this book. Uh, he shared with it on uh, his social media. I think he shared with it in maybe a sermon or two. And so that's how I learned learned about the book. And since all of you enjoyed Brian Zahn, I thought you would enjoy uh, Cheryl as well. Um, so Cheryl, why don't you just take a few moments to give us a little details about your background, uh, your faith journey, so they can get to know you a little bit. Sure. Um, I am fourth generation classical Pentecostal. And my great grandmother in 1905, seven um, had the experience they they called baptism of the holy spirit and was um expelled from her methodist church uh, wow. for her shouting and things like that i think she created a ruckus of some sort so my great grandfather said well sally i'll just build you a church where you can shout now she never pastored the church but uh they later joined and were part of the um, Pentecostal Holiness Church, which is where I grew up in that. And I'm a member of that church today, the, the, that tradition today. And so, um, you know, I, um, I grew up in a really wonderful, for me, it was a wonderful church of a rural church of a lot of extended relatives. And that has its downside as well. But yeah. for me, it was a good, safe environment. People would sometimes say, um, we sense the hand of God on your life or whatever. And you just do everything, you know, you play in the church orchestra, you um, do all the Christmas plays. And and uh, eventually, I, I think I ended up when I was 16, being asked to preach my first sermon on a Sunday night. Oh, wow. That's, so I, uh, that's, that's very, it was very affirming. Yeah, that's very similar to my own trajectory. Well, I mean, from a very young age, you know, we were taught uh, how to read the Bible and how to prepare sermons and uh, do communion addresses and whatnot. And I think I was a, about 16 years old when I gave my first sermon on a Sunday evening as well. So that's very uh, interesting yeah, similarity. It is. And that apprenticeship, it seems today, is more rare. Yeah. Um, but it's so valuable, isn't it? It is. Well, you know, in the days of live streams and uh making sure the worship flows and whatnot. There's so mm -hmm. much emphasis on the theatrics of it all and the organization of it all that you almost can't risk apprenticeship, you know? So so many people have that sort of, uh, that need to be in control, the need of things to go so perfectly. And in a world where, like I said, you can just go back on the live stream and watch it all. You know, people are so conscious of image that, they, that they're not willing to risk uh, the beauty of apprenticeship. Yeah, yeah and I noticed that. Um after a few years of teaching seminary where I would be getting students and these were college grads um, had been called into ministry of some sort, but uh, they did not really know how to do public prayers or hmm. they did not know any idea of a sermon was somewhat frightening to them. And many of them, like a lot of Gen X maybe had grown up in larger, larger churches and wow. big youth groups where they really did not get opportunities to explore their leadership skills. And, but on the other hand, in our seminary, we had a lot of people from around the world, majority world. And so I would have seasoned bishops and ministers there the same time. But yeah, that type of um, apprenticing, I think is just very scriptural. For sure. Uh, for sure. And it is, it is a lost start, but thankful for people like you out there in the, in the world of seminaries uh, who are leading people through that sort of thing, even if it is a little bit later in life. So 
Um, after you preached your first sermon when you were 16, where did things kind of go from there? Well, I went to college trying to discern the calling of God on my life, you know, and um, I had a lot, of, I had women models of missionary and evangelists, but not many pastors at that time. We're talking about starting college in 1971. Uh, so I had just tried to explore what was I to do. And then I went to, on a mission trip to Latin America and sensed, well, maybe I should be a missionary and, uh, and met my husband in my junior year of college. Uh, I told him, you know, I'm, I'm never getting married. I'm going to be a single missionary. And he just laughed at me and said, oh, you just don't have what it takes, which just insulted me in some ways, but I think he was right. Oh, and <laughs> so we graduated together from Lee University, Lee College at that time, and went to Wheaton, uh, Wheaton Graduate School together, which was a really good, good experience. Wheaton was a gracious, uh, warm, evangelical place to be. And uh, after that, we taught at a Bible college in North Dakota for three years. Our oldest daughter was born there. And my husband pastored a couple of small rural churches out in the prairie area. And that was a good, um, that was a good time. You, you're teaching in a Bible college, so if the dean sees anything on your transcript, you end up teaching it. And, but, it, you know, baptism of fire, you learn, you learn a lot. Yeah. Um, and so then we went back to school to get our PhD at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville and uh, was at that time a different school than it is now. So you both went through every phase of college together from undergrad to grad? To yeah, I mean, uh, I went to uh, a junior college and transferred in. So, yeah. but from time that we met in the you know, our junior year of college, yeah, we did. We did. Uh, masters and uh, doctoral work together. Wow, that's so cool. Um, my mm -hmm. wife and I, we took a few what we call preaching school classes together, and mm -hmm. we would go home and uh, at night and you know do the homework together and talk about the study guides, and it was a lot of fun just to be able to have that experience together. I I can't imagine going all the way through graduate school together though. That's that's pretty impressive. Um, it it's good on one side because you you know what the other person's going through. The dialogue is wonderful. You can support one another, but when the when you're in comps and you're in a real pinch, there's not someone to carry the extra, so to speak. Yeah. And so it has its benefits, and then it also has some of the drawbacks. For sure, yeah, I could see that. So, mm -hmm. so what in your life happened to make you sort of discover this book, Reenchanting the Text, within you? <laughs> What, what happened within your life to make you go, wow, this, I have this whole book in my heart that I could put on a page? Yeah, um, I talk a bit about my experience in the, the first part of the book when I was interviewing, my husband and I were interviewing at an evangelical seminary in New England. And we had thought we would go there if we had friends there. and um, But they were highly suspicious of me uh, in terms of, some of the faculty were in terms of view of scripture and and uh, we had been trying to uh, understand how um, our tradition read scripture in many ways very literally yes but in other ways um reading it in a deeply spiritual way as if god was actually present there in that in the text uh, and that interview helped me clarify what i was not i was not sort of the standard evangelical whatever words inerrancy or whatever words people were using um that you know they said well you have a low view of scripture because you you people read the bible with experience and i thought that's just i thought of all the saints that I had known who had literally worn out Bibles. Yeah. And, you know, using Eugene Peterson's language, they had eaten the Bible. I mean, it just imbibed it. It was, they sang it, they prayed it, they read it. It was their constant companion. And I felt so like, I'm not going to betray these people 
and agree with these uh, professors here that my tradition has a low view of scripture. And I said, well, if anyone in this room has a low view of scripture, it's not me. <laughs> uh, and because we read, we believe yeah. that the same spirit who inspired the text is present, fully present in the reading and the preaching and the teaching of the text. So that to me is a high view of scripture. That put both my husband and me on this journey of, of so what do we mean by, um, and a long time of, uh, in the Pentecostal scholars of our generation, spent a lot of time on hermeneutics. Um, is there a spirit reading of the text? Is there a tradition of, you know, Pentecostal hermeneutics and things like that? But then I began to think that there was a deeper issue, at, a, a real deeper issue at stake, which was the uh, not just how to read the Bible or interpret, but what would precede that is the, the question of the ontology. What is the Bible? Oh, yeah. What is its nature? What is its, how, how was it created? And um those and then John Webster's work, uh, his little work, Holy Scripture, uh, that just was so in, helpful for me in terms of, and I quote him quite a bit in the book. And I just felt like um, we got to go deeper than hermeneutics. And there's also what has happened to the Bible in modernity. It's happened to all of us, uh, you know, the modern world, you know, according with Charles Taylor saying, we all became disenchanted. We all became scientific, so to speak. Um, and we became um, people who, if there was a supernatural world that we didn't really in interact, only crazy people, right, did that. Right, so. Right high suspicion of things like that. And I found, you know, this is not just, I've done so much ecumenical work in my life with Roman Catholics, Mennonites, Orthodox, you name it. So I knew mainline Protestant uh, readings of scripture had, had fallen in line with the European um, historical critical methodology. And, you know, there's just this layers of history and you just pull back and try to find uh, each layer, kind of a archaeology of the text and right. how these communities evolved and understood God. That That's one side of that modern coin coming out of the German universities and all. But then the other side that we don't always acknowledge is how American, especially American fundamentalism, evangelicalism was influenced and prided itself in being scientific modernist and we have the scientific proper reading of the bible and uh people like bb warfield and hodge they they said you know the bible is like any other scientific document it can be proven to be true and um and god gave it in a perfect form and we can just now take this and uh, and Warfield, it was kind of like uh, when Jesus went back to heaven, he took all of the miracles with him. He took all of the all that stuff, maybe a little residual left on the apostles, right? <laughs> Disciples. Right, right. But when they died, it's all. And, you know, he, he was lecturing uh, the Smythe lectures at Columbia Theological Seminary, Presbyterian Seminary, 1917. And he just warned all those young Presbyterian guys to beware of um, the magic of the Roman Catholic Church, mm. uh, you know, and anything in history that recorded miracles. He said, you know, St. Anthony's uh, records of miracles, that's just, that was Egyptian magic. It wasn't, and that you only you don't need miracles when you have this perfect bible and so revelation became what's collapsed into scripture and revelation is larger than scripture it's 
you know, God's revealing God's self in always. And but if that collapsed into scripture, word as we were talking earlier with the capital W, the creator word, the uh, pre-incarnate word, the the word that holds all things together, all that was collapsed into scripture. Yeah. And so you have this text that's just denuded of real presence. It's a non-sacramental, a non-living, a text that is an artifact of history. So on one hand, on a real liberal side, you've got it as just an artifact of history. But on the other side, it's not living either. It's an artifact. Um, and you have then this heavy burden put on people of disenchantment of just not under not believing in real presence when when i was raised um i was taught to view the bible basically like how you've described um the the scripture is not a book of science but when it speaks of science it speaks accurately scripture is not a book of history but when it speaks of history it speaks accurately uh, scripture is not a book of geography, but when it speaks of geography, it always speaks accurately. And there was this burden placed upon the text of this this need to be, from a 21st century perspective, scientifically and historically accurate, that when you walk into a first-year college classroom uh, in a state university, immediately all your assumptions and all your beliefs are challenged. And since you're yeah. taught, belief in the Bible this way uh, is the only path is the only mm -hmm. road that you can walk and to deny a literal reading of maybe a text about Leviathan and Job is to deny the resurrection of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You're taught that those are on the same level because if every word isn't viewed from their perspective, the highest possible level, then you might as well just chunk the whole thing out because who's to believe it anyways. And yeah. then the yeah. burden, the burden of being, uh, transformed by, by the Holy Spirit was placed upon the reader because the Holy Spirit was collapsed into the word as well. Uh, I grew up oh, in what was called. Point. That's yeah, a good point. I, I grew up in what was called the word only view. So we believed that the word or the Holy Spirit only interacted in a person's life through the word, which meant mm -hmm. that the Holy Spirit's ability and range to, to transform a person was through their own ability to read, interpret, uh, and apply scripture in the way that it was originally tended in those perfect uh, inspired and errant autographs. Yeah. That, yeah. Put, that puts a lot of responsibility on the individual. Oh, it does. The human mind then becomes the vehicle for it all, doesn't it? Exactly, um, yes. And the Holy Spirit, I've heard you know the phrase, well, the Spirit will bring to your mind or it, the, if the spirit is present at all in that understanding, it's kind of like this mild mannered coach of some sort. But and the Trinity becomes Father, Son, and Scripture. Yes, Father, Son, and Holy Bible, as we say. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yes. That's true. That's exactly what happens. Um, let me think. I think there was something else you were talking about there. That oh yes, so the. Basically, what happened is that the fundamentalists allowed this higher critical uh, scholarship, maybe even the skeptic, from the skeptical point of view, to dictate how they read scripture. Basically, they mm -hmm. say, well, we critique scripture because it doesn't hold up to these modern standards. And then they felt uh, it was their uh, calling to defend scripture from those same standards instead of questioning the standards themselves. And so yeah. they ended up becoming basically just a copy of the other side, except, you know, both pointing fingers and saying that the other was ignorant and, you know, didn't have really anything to offer and whatever else, you know. Um, and talking just past each other, just um, the Bible just became a weapon. Yeah. Yes. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that. Uh, you talked about the word collapsing into the text. And in Hebrews 4, you know, there's the passage that the word of God is, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And when you read that from at least how I was taught to read scripture, that's the Bible. The, the word is the Bible, even though in the very next uh, passage, it uses, I think, a, 
it uses the pronoun he to refer back to, to the word in mm -hmm. verse 12, mm -hmm. indicating that perhaps this is Jesus or this is the wisdom or logot, the logos. And so it's funny that you mention that because there's all kinds of passages in scripture, sanctify them through thy truth. Your word is truth. And we read that, well, that's the Bible. But from John's perspective, that's the eternal logos that sanctifies the believer. And so we do have a tendency to collapse to collapse the word of God into the, into the text itself. Yes, we do. Um, um, we separate the Bible from, from Christ, the living word in such a way that um, we do not have a sense that Christ is continuing to speak through the word by the spirit to us or, um, mm -hmm. It's like Jesus went away and it's coming back, but the Bible's the only thing we got until then. I was I was taught that uh, that that the Holy Spirit basically left the world uh, with the death of the last apostle, or perhaps the death of the last person whom the apostles laid hands on, uh, or sometime towards the end of the first century, basically. Um, yeah. There, there's this uh, line that you threw out in in the book from uh, Karl Barth, and it was the unsubor that the, oh, let's see, the line here was unsubordinating the spirit. What, what kind of, what does that line mean to you? And how does that sort of play into this discussion that we're uh, having this, this afternoon? Yeah, I think that um, scripture, as, as Webster would say too, is um, pneumatologically formed and continues um, that the home of scripture is the life of God, the economy of God's salvation, that scripture was designed to bring about God's redemption of all things. And it serves in the purposes of God. In that sense, it is made perfect. It is holy. It is sacramental. It is real presence. It is powerful. But in order to, to have that, you cannot take scripture out of the life of God. It, it continues by, a, you need a rich pneumatology. Mm -hmm. Just as Jesus did nothing apart from the Spirit, right. the Bible does not speak apart from the Spirit. It continues to speak through. So scripture is a means whereby the revel, it, to me it's a primary means, whereby the revelation of God continues. More, he, he said, I would suggest the tension be posed in terms of a spiritless word, which is rationalism on the one hand, and a mm -hmm. wordless spirit, subjectivism on the other. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, you know, the charismatic tradition can have some craziness. And one <laughs> of the things they do is they have this wordless spirit thing go where they do not ground in scripture, they don't judge in scripture, they do not discern, by, they get new revelations, they get private revelations, they, uh, all of that, as Paul looked at in the church of Corinth, is, is really bad. But then you have a spiritless word where it is, um, it's kind of like this, you read it and you interpret it and you apply it. It's all up to you, right? Right, you, as right. you were saying earlier, and it all has to go through the filters of the human mind. And so you're in charge here. I read, I interpret, I apply. I read, I interpret, I apply. Oh, where is um, where is a living word in that? It's not. Hmm. Let's see. So how I, I just thought about this question or I would have mentioned it to you before we started. Um, mm -hmm. How does this affect Christian unity? If someone's view is sort of this rational uh, worldview where it's a spiritless word, how would we ever have Christian unity if it's up to the individual to interpret and apply uh, scripture? Because we all come, you know, from different backgrounds, different worldviews, we're trained how to read scripture differently. What hope would there be of Christian unity without the continued work of the Holy Spirit, right? That's true. Um... You know, Christian unity, especially in the essentials of the faith, is 
is important. Uh, John 17 is not just a, a sidebar. Um, it's, not, and, it's not wishful thinking, right? It's not. It's the heart of Christ. And to um, what happens with this spiritless human interpreting of the word is that unity is only possible if you're if you check off all the boxes that I have. So right. you have now so you you get people together and you got the boxes checking off right here and here and you've got yours and then therefore oh wait a minute there's one box you didn't check off so sorry you're out. Goodbye. Yeah. Goodbye. And I I've seen that I've seen that a lot. And it um, it really damages and divides the body of Christ. And I know that there are really essentials for me where I say I'm, you know, I have no, I have, I, I have fellowship with you as in human fellowship. Sure. But I do not have fellowship with you in the Word and in, in the Spirit. I still can honor and respect you, and I can. We can have a, a a really great conversation here. Yeah, yeah. And I see interfaith and other things like that. But then there's this other dynamic of the spirit and the word um, binding us together. And I discovered a lot of that in the years that I was in the Roman Catholic uh, Pentecostal International Dialogue. At that time, the Vatican sent uh, charismatic roman catholics into the dialogue and you know for them word is ecclesially formed ecclesially contained so it's not so much the protestant individual mind as much as the church holds this right and um and i would i would often you know jab them and say we well, you know You've substituted ecclesiology for pneumatology. Mm. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, I have seen so many Roman Catholics with um, who love the word, or filled with the spirit, who we had such unity. I had more unity with them than I would with some of my Protestant brothers and sisters. And it was a unity that... Um, was born by the spirit and we may have different views about maybe uh purgatory or, or whatever but sure it was um or something deeper that would transcend all of that yeah yeah you know that's one thing i've noticed as well uh since uh since having some negative experiences within the church of christ and being you know disfellowshipped by family members and things like that who are a little bit more strict than I am uh, when it comes to our tradition. Um, I've had the privilege because of that of having fellowship with people from other denominations. And that's one thing that I've found is beneath uh, the exterior customs and traditions and our particular ways of reading scripture and our particular, you know, secondary, how we interpret maybe some secondary doctrines, there's just this underlying flow, mm -hmm. the spirit, love, uh, wisdom that attracts me to these kinds of people. And, and, you know, you meet them like people like, for example, Brian Zond, you know, totally yeah. different backgrounds, but there's just something in there that's going, wait a minute, this, I, this is, these are my people, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and that's, yeah. that seems to be your experience. And a, a friend and I were talking about this just last week at, at a church camp, we took our youth groups to, and he, he was going through what you were saying a moment ago, you know, there's this list of things we have to agree on the check boxes. And if you miss one of them, you're out. So, but if, but if there's not that, then how do we know who's in and who's out? Basically, if we don't have some kind of system, uh, you know, to us from our background, just saying, well, it's the Holy spirit is basically saying that you're throwing away any kind of guidelines whatsoever. Right. Uh, because we, we lived in such a disenchanted world. Um, so, what would you say to someone who's kind of going through that dilemma of, well, where is the line? Well, you yeah. Know, yeah. And that, I think I've been thinking a lot about this. Um, and I've concluded, I preached a sermon about this recently on the straight and narrow, you yeah. know, Oh yeah. that 
I've concluded there's some deep ditches. On, there's a deep ditch on either side of this straight and narrow. And I have seen people fall off into the deep ditch of disenchanted legalism, uh, check off all the boxes. And grace is just very hard to be found. And then on the other side, I have seen maybe people who were raised in that other side who they got free from it, but they didn't know where to stop. Once the dominoes fall, they just go all the way. And so they kind of give up on the Bible. They give up on so much of the orthodox faith, as we would call the, you know, Apostles' Creed or Nicene Creed, the 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 what um, we have always called in church history the faith right and um the one holy apostolic catholic faith they just and every anything goes and everything goes any sexual lifestyle any belief it it and i just i see them in such bondage they are in bondage to lasciviousness and a lifestyle that's not going to to be in any way um, healthy for them. And so there's this middle, I think, that we are called to. And to stay on that road, we need, you know, church history has provided, the, the ancients have provided us with the, um, the way, the disciplines, the the markers of whether you're following Saint, uh, Thomas Akempis or whether you're following, but they're the the fasting, the prayer, the the time and word, the the solitude, the quietness, the and then there's corporate worship with believers. Yeah. And you know my tradition historically has seen um, that you don't get this sort of private interpretation necessarily of scripture that you need it seem good to the Holy Spirit and to us, as they say in the book of Acts. Right. And the us is this communal discernment uh, that helps guide you, keep yeah. you along. And the Orthodox say that the best, um, you know, they, they believe icons are like portals into eternity. Uh, and they would say, though, that the best icon is a living icon. We would say a saint, um, that saints are living examples of what it means to live in the presence of God and to surround ourselves with holy people, sainted people, people who have gone before us. Uh, they may be even dead, but we, we read and we study them, or they may be living and our culture is just missing that altogether, especially we Protestant evangelicals. But, um, we just don't know what to do, how to cultivate elders. We've got CEOs, we've got celebrities, we've got all this, but we don't have a lot of holy, godly elders. Um, that They're like the guideposts that will just say, Cheryl, there's a ditch over here. Yeah, you may want to think twice before you take that route. Or um, there are some dangers if you follow this belief. Let me tell you some things. And um, they're just really good, helpful guideposts. So I see scripture as a, a means of staying on the straight and narrow. I see the community of faith as that. I see church tradition as that, um, the disciplines. And um, and I just didn't realize maybe until recently how deep the ditch is on either side. And I just didn't realize how deep it can get. You know, one thing I noticed when I started questioning some of the beliefs I was raised with in that sort of extreme fundamentalist uh, way mm -hmm. of viewing the world is when I got over to the left side, I looked at one of my friends who was kind of a mentor for me and I said, what's going on here? They are 
they're being just as ugly, just as oh. here's the list of things you have to check off. Here's the oh, things yeah. you have to do and whatever and believe. And so like, what I, I thought over here, there would be grace and love and acceptance. And it seems the opposite of that. And he said, yep, you've, uh, you've cracked the code, you know, <laughs> you figured it out. And so, um, mm -hmm. when I was, when I was talking to my friend last week, where we kind of landed was, you know, there's this great line from apostle, the apostle Paul in Galatians five, where he talks about the work of the flesh, but then he talks about the work of or the fruit of the spirit, um, mm -hmm. love and joy and peace. And at the end of this, he says, and against, against such things, there is no law. Mm -hmm. And we kind of realized that you know, who is, who is in and who is out is not about, you know, which, which list of beliefs they subscribe to, or because anybody can do that. But what, what we would need to look for in people is what Jesus told us to look for. And that is fruit, you know, yes. does their faith in Christ produce love for others? Does it produce peace and patience and long suffering? And, and that's the kind of people who I think we're naturally drawn to anyways. Uh, and so that's, mm -hmm. that's the kind of people that, uh, you know, that are, that are being the image of Christ in the world and who are spirit filled. Um, you know, they bear that fruit. Well, don't they? Yeah, the, they're yeah. so, you know, we're so drawn to them. Yes. But are. a little bit uncomfortable. So, you know, real saints aren't nice sometimes. Oh, they're kind, sure. but the ones that I have known make me a little uncomfortable. They do, don't they? They, they make in you a good way. In, mm -hmm. Yeah, in a good way. Uh, but mm -hmm. this kind of goes back this whole discussion we've had on lack of elders uh, in our tribes um, to lack of apprenticeship, which is probably related to lack of elders, right? We have mm -hmm. CEOs as the elders in churches and not uh, leaders who have apprentices who, who create disciples, you know, who follow Jesus's mm -hmm. sayings in Matthew 28 to go out and to make disciples and teach them to observe the ways. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, yeah we have to have so many scandals to mega pastors mega church pastors and you just you know it's weekly now almost i know and this this last week has been tough hasn't it <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it's been tough all right so i want to all right hang on just a second hey katie go see mommy okay i'm talking to my friend here come here come here come here come here this is my son kaden say hey to everybody hey, Hi there. Say, hey. All right. Daddy, That's Miss Cheryl. Daddy, is that is a library <laughs> guy who when people are going by books. Uh, she is not a librarian, but she does have a lot of books like me in my office. Wow. I do. Yep. Yeah, I've got does. some books. She has a lot of books. <laughs> but, All right. But Daddy, I have more books than you. She has more books than me? Maybe so. Probably Maybe so. Maybe so. She's had longer <laughs> to collect them than I have. I just started collecting them a couple of years ago. Okay. Bye bye, buddy. All right, He's a so, doll. Oh thank, my goodness. You, thank you so much. I told you he'd walk in here eventually. <laughs> uh, my wife is is still uh, rocking the baby. She, I think, she was having trouble taking a nap, so that's what mm -hmm. he's doing here. All right, um, I wanna, I want to shift gears here for just a second because I know we don't have too too long left, and I wanted to get on this subject. Um, there was one book, in, there was one passage in your book that resonated with me more than any other, and. I was not even ready for it when it came about because here I am thinking this book is about scripture and how to inter and how to interpret scripture or approach scripture. And then I come across this line. This is from us. This is from almost said Psalm 166. This is from page 167. Here we go. Uh, he says, you, you say here, Smith gives a poignant description of his initiation into embodied worship after growing up in a rabidly fundamentalist and cessationist tradition. I remember how physically difficult it was to get my body to participate in worship. I remember the utter awkwardness of raising a hand in praise, almost as if it were cemented to my side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I still struggle with this. Mm -hmm. I still oh, yeah. struggle with this. We we sing songs uh, in our tradition, lift, lift your hands to the Father, or uh, with my hands lifted high, and people will raise hands. And then as soon as that line is over, shoop, right back down, you know. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> talk, share, share with us a little bit here uh, about embodied worship and how this is related to an enchanted uh, worldview. Yeah. You know, we became what James K. Smith calls after, you know, the enlightenment time, we just became like thinking things or thinking machines. And 
what defined us was our mind and which is wonderful. Um, but we almost made it this way. There's either um, rational or irrational. Yeah. Uh, but I say in the book there, there's the transrational. Mm. And embodiment is a, a key element of living in an enchanted world. Um, you know, I don't have a body. I am embodied. Jesus Christ, the incarnation, was embodied. God embodied. And he just didn't jump into a body and then jump out. But And to be embodied is to have a sense of um, connectedness to the, to the physical, natural, to the world itself. And in ways that we can experience with, uh, we can know with all of our senses, not just a couple. Uh, children are more naturally that way, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Caden more naturally that way. and But we, we get out of it and we're schooled out of it. We're taught, taught to be out of it. And to grow up and mature is to just get almost disembodied. And the um, old Star Trek series, the original one, had, you know, this evolutionary time when they meet these people who were uh, didn't need their bodies. They were just brains. Uh, we, you know, that was sort of like, that's how we, uh, but to embody uh, knowing and experience, I I lean into Black church more for that. Uh, you know, I teach at United Seminary now part-time, and 98% um, of our doctorate ministry program is black church black baptist primarily and i didn't know there were so many varieties of black baptist it's wonderful but the word is embodied it's sung it's danced it's it it is not just here right or we go to other cultures you know outside the us where we see that they're not so disconnected from from their bodies yeah our 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 worship um so many of the men and women we go into the to the sanctuary we sit in a pew we cross mm -hmm. our arms like this and mm -hmm. if we allow ourselves we might tap our foot a little bit uh yeah. to the song you know but if there's hardwood floors you don't want to tap too much or it might become percussion and then in the church of christ you've just added an instrument to the, to the mix you know so we, we have to you know we're very very tame uh Mm -hmm. almost so too much so and those who do uh lift their hands or maybe even clap uh might even be looked down on when, when i was a kid went to a bible bowl competition we we did a uh a, a sort of a a bible bowl on the book of acts kind of like games of jeopardy and a turn a tournament yeah, style yeah. oh i used churches. to love those things oh, oh yeah, yeah they're fun <laughs> well this there was a black church there and we started singing one of the songs and they started clapping to it and all all of us uh trained young white people we just sort of looked and stopped singing and just kind of didn't know what to do with ourselves with people clapping in the audience oh yeah <laughs> so here, here's here's a question for you then um what advice would you give to someone who wishes to participate in that embodied kind of worship but might be the only one in their church to do so you know, there might not be others there uh maybe maybe someone would join in if they did it but they're not sure about that you know what what advice what advice and, might you um, give a person like that? You know, you may, may want to just um, visit some embodied churches, kind of to loosen up a bit. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, kind of then become a missionary, so to speak, into to your church. Uh, I've, I've been in churches where there's just one or two, uh, you know, and then people look around, they go, well, that might be okay. And yeah. then there are three or four, and then it happens with um, kind of a uh, giving permission. Sure. It, it sometimes takes one person. Uh, but I do think that the top leadership, the key leadership, have to either facilitate it, or if not facilitate it, um, permit it. Right. Because if it's not, 
if it's frowned on by the worship leader, the the pastors, the, then you're it, that's not good usually. Yeah. So, well, in my congregation in particular, our worship leader is he very much wants people to get involved in in clapping mm. and raising hands and whatnot. He he loves it. He loves it. Mm. Um, he has such a hard time doing it though because our culture. I mean, we were mm -hmm. taught from a very young age. You know, this is just not how you worship. Even at football games, I have a friend who told me that her father at football games doesn't even shout out and cheer. He just sits there, looks mad. And after the game, did you enjoy the game, Dad? Oh, it was wonderful. Loved it. But there's mm -hmm. no body language at all just because we have uh, turned that part of our cells completely off almost. It's. Uh, I, I imagine he'll have an easier time doing it as time goes on, but... For right now, he still he still struggles with trying to get people to participate, except for that one little that one little part of the song where it mentions lifting oh, hands. And lifting I hands. see, yeah. kind of up and down. Up yeah, and down. yeah, yeah, yeah. It it um, well, James K. Smith talks just how hard it was growing up in a fundamentalist yeah. church where just very difficult. I believe too that if we open ourselves to the Spirit then um, I go back to my great grandmother where we started. She, she got beside herself maybe too much or whatever and, <laughs> and was expelled from her church. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's kind of an irony that I'm teaching now at this Methodist seminary that experienced this great renewal a few years ago from the Toronto over to anyway, it's in Dayton, Ohio, but, they have exuberant worship, not just the black church, but the, the Anglos and um, real stiff. They were what, you know, ties and the Dean is he looks really stiff. But when the spirit comes on him, he's he's just all out there. And then one of the theology professors is Italian and he's naturally um, uh, Ex expressive and yeah. I told them I said I'm fourth generation Pentecostal but you guys really scare me <laughs> and uh, it took me to go to this Methodist school and what would my great grandmother think now that I'm the one who's having a hard time sure sure uh, with all of this and you're the ones who are all all over the floor yeah. and I'm walking over you just uh it's so interesting for me to see uh things like that, that break stereotypes that, yeah. um, but it's a group of Methodists out there who, uh, you know, who just wanted to break out of, as the Dean says, David Watson, who's over the Firebrand magazine and all of that. You know, I grew up, he said, traditional Methodist, United Methodist, and uh, never really believed in divine action that God was actually present yeah. to do anything. Wow. I didn't believe, you know, we're operatively we're somewhat ag agnostic in that, aren't we? Yep. That is, is there real divine presence here? Is, is, is there actually divine action? And then when he became open to that, um, it, it, you know, he goes to Cuba a lot and just the Methodists there are wild. So he he um, has discovered, as he said, that um, God is not just the object like we think about up there, but God is the actor with us. God is speaking. God is directing and moving in among us. Um, we we sometimes Protestant worth it worship just became. Why would we even need God? Right. And our our role in Protestant worship, especially for more of a reformed tradition where you know you have mm -hmm. the regulative principle in action, it's it's more about checking off the boxes anyways, following yes. the pattern, being in the New Testament church, uh, completing our scheduled worship service for the week, and then going mm -hmm. home and you know <laughs> mm -hmm. waiting waiting until the next week. Um so that wow. I I just really I really appreciate your perspective here today. Um, do, you have, it. do you have anything that you want to share about your book that we haven't hit on in these 45 minutes together? 
you know, when I, I finished it and all, I sat for a while and I, I thought, you know, everything must change in the sense that an enchanted reading of the Bible where we believe that there is real presence, that by the Spirit, um, the Bible becomes a portal into the life of God, and we are literally reading in the presence of God. I mean, that is huge, isn't it? That yeah. we are we are there. God is with us. Um, but in order to really get there, I think we've got to, and I, I move toward the end of the book, toward that, uh, we've got to become re-enchanted people. Yeah. Because the disenchanted text is just a result of disenchanted people, people, communities, uh, churches. And I don't mean that we've got to kind of go crazy and um, see thin spaces everywhere and, and visions all the I'm not, but we do need, I believe, to live more liminally in a sense of the how far is eternity? Yeah. It's just right here. Right. You know, we used to think heaven, how far was heaven? Well, how many billion miles? It's not, it's, it's here. It's that veil that Mark's gospel has tearing open a lot. Mm. Um, if we really believed that God was present, whether bidden or not, well, in Carl Young, but there's this, then things change. Everything must change in that, doesn't it? Yeah, that's right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I went from a very distant view of God to a very present view of God in my own faith journey. And, you know, God isn't up in heaven taking our lists of prayers and deciding whether or not to accept them or reject them or pass them on to later. God is active. And as Paul says in uh, Acts chapter 17, he's not very far from any one of us, you know? No. Wow. Uh, so w one of the things that, people used to do in our very disenchanted uh, disenchanted tradition is someone would get up at a conference or something and he would say all right uh, let's let's sing as if Jesus was sitting right next to you in the pew you know whereas mm -hmm. you're saying well Jesus is sitting right next to us in the pew and so we better be <laughs> singing out and worshiping because there he is you know right right here with us now yeah when Paul says you know we sit together in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Yeah. It was we will, but we we are sitting together, and that to understand that um, this is real thin space sometimes, and you know we get to see that maybe in the deathbed of someone who yeah. is crossing over, and they. But I believe that we could see it even more often, and worship is an opportunity for that, or scripture reading, or holy conversation like you and I are having. Yeah, it, it, it can get very thin. I think so. I feel it. I feel it myself. This has mm -hmm. been great. Um, well, before you go, Cheryl, would you like to share anything with us? Uh, any projects you're working on or, or maybe a website or something? So a way for people just to uh, follow your ministry. Yeah, my website, I haven't done much to it. I haven't, it's a long time, uh, but it's CherylBJohns.com. Okay. And I'm on Twitter uh, and CBJohns. Um, and I'm on Facebook. Um, I am currently moving toward full retirement and Oh wow, congratulations. Thank you. It's been a long journey, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, tell somebody I started teaching with the mimeograph machine, chalkboard, so it's about time. Yeah. And my husband and I have a small farm and I've been trying to do some things around here that uh he's still teaching full time. But there's a book on the back burner. There's some articles that I'm working on. The book on the back burner, though, is much along the lines of re-enchanting the text. But as I mentioned in the end of the book, um, the creation, the, the the ancients talked about the two books, uh, creation and scripture. Yeah. And either along the lines of recovering the lost book of creation. Oh, wow. Uh and I use the imagery in my mind of, you know, when Josiah did all of these great reforms, they found the book of the law. Mm. It's been there in the in the temple all this time. And then they go and they go, well, we found this book. Look at this. And it had just 
nobody had paid attention. Uh, wow. And I think that's how we are with uh, the, the creation, where we're talking about um, if we collapse everything into scripture, then that other book of Revelation, it's not um, real presence there either, right? It's just. Well, that's, that's my thin place. Uh, I was out walking this morning in our local state park uh, for about two or three miles with mm -hmm. a couple of friends having sacred conversation. And that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the re-enchanting re creation, that'd be great. I, I can't wait to see what you have to say there. Um, yeah. We, I, I mean, for cre creation for, for a big portion of Christians is a tool used to prove the reliability of Scripture. Uh, how old is it? You know, it was, was there or was there not a yeah. global flood and whatnot? And then for another side, like you've mentioned in this book, uh, creation is a bunch of math and and a bunch of laws and it all operates in this way and that. And so, wow, I, I bet there's a lot of fun things you could do with that book. I'm excited. Well, anyways, we, we don't need to talk another hour on, on uh, the second book of creation or the first, maybe the first book of God. So we'll, we'll go ahead and end the interview there, but Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me today. Um, I'm so glad we had this time together and I look forward to continuing to follow your ministry. And I hope a lot of people, um, are able to pick up re-enchanting the text uh, at hopefully a local bookstore. Maybe you'll just go there and ask them to order it for you because they can. I do it all the time. So anyways, uh, Cheryl, thank you again. God thank bless you, you and your ministry. God bless you. Thank you for all you've done. And for all of you who are Enjoy. listening out there, uh, be sure to follow Cheryl and tune in for the next podcast. Thank you.